My next guest is one of the most enduring figures in the sport of national hunt racing. He was one of the very best amateur riders and has been at the top of the, the trading tree for well over three decades. He had a particularly purple patch in the late 80s and the early 90s when he trained no fewer than six festival winners, including the West Awake, who completed that rare double of winning both the Sun Alliance Novice Hurdle and the Sun Alliance Chase. Later in his career, he earned fame as the trainer of the very popular Grand National winner, Many Clouds. His dignity in that horse's end was a great example to so many in the sport of horse racing. You know, he first, further served to enhance his popularity. The last year, however, has been incredibly challenging. Not only was he forced to vacate his longtime home, Roanhurst, to move to a, another stable down the road in Lambourne, near down, but he has also battled his way through cancer, which he uh, contracted midway through 2021. He has now been given the all clear. He also has a horse who would once again take him all the way to the top in Queen's Gamble. He is, of course, Oliver Sherwood. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning, Nick. Thank you very much. Very uh, kind of you. The most important thing is you're looking incredibly well and feeling well, I gather. Yeah, I'm feeling good. Um, really good. Uh, uh, I put on a bit of weight and um, my last night was, oh, it's always at a standing dish. We go to Tim Siders uh, for dinner and the one thing I haven't got my back in is my drinking boots, so I can't touch any red wine, which is probably a very good reason uh, to feel better. Probably not a bad thing. A good thing, I think. Okay. You, as I said, you are an example to all of us. So I, <laughs> I don't know about I, that at all. I, hopefully that persists. Um, just tell me a little bit about the last, the last year. Whenever I see you, you've always had a smile on your face, but that is you as a general rule. How, just how challenging has it been for you mentally as well as physically? I think it's been much more challenging for my family rather than me. You just feel going through sort of cancer, as I said uh, before to plenty of people, the word cancer and chemotherapy are two swear words. Um, and when you get told you've got uh, cancer, um, you've just got to get on with it. Um, it's much harder for Tanya and uh, my, my, my four children, my eldest two for my first marriage and uh, Archie and Sabrina for my second marriage. Archie was in Australia at the time. Uh, so you just feel pretty average. Funny enough, the first three sessions of chemotherapy I went through, it was just a breeze. And I thought, what's all the fuss about, you know? Um, and uh, then I got COVID just before my uh, fourth session. And then I, from January, February, March onwards, I, I really did feel awful. But it was if there is such a thing so i've been told it was a, a relatively good cancer there is no such thing as good cancer that's the wrong wording but it was very treatable um uh, even though i got told there was a sort of 60 40 session mm -hmm. uh, percentage of that might can get through it um to hear that was much harder for tanya there's no doubt about it and she was a um a, a totally unbelievable nurse we're very scared of of cancer, and yeah. quite rightly, one in two people is a, is affected by it. Everybody is affected by it, either directly or or indirectly. Do you think the word has more power, in a sense, than it than it ought to have over the over the over the patient? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I, I just people don't know. Uh, I, I always go back, sorry, I'm going, I'm going back. W w when it first, the likes of John Joe O'Neill and Bob Champion had got given cancer, or got told they had cancer, it was, it, it was virtually a death sentence. And they got through it, and they got given their chemotherapy in a bucket to be sick in, and that was it, and get on with it. Now the preventivist stuff they give you is, is staggering. And, uh, and you just said one in 2.2. I got told that after my first sort of checkup, and that blew me away. One in, that's every other person virtually. I thought it'd be one in five, one in six sort of people have, have had or got some sort of cancer. And they're improving things. Even from my first session of chemo to my last session, the nurses at uh, the hospital where I was working, or where I was being treated, there was different medicines or med or coming in and being I've been given them, uh, which it just shows how quickly everything is improving. It's just staggering. I'm absolutely blown away by the, A, the treatment and, uh, and the drugs you get given. I, w I was reading your lovely piece in the paper today with, with, with Lee Moss's head, and you said there were only three days where you didn't go into the, into the yard. Mm. How, how important was it for you to be seen to be there? Oh, very. R really important. As, as sort of team leader, uh, I, 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 I think it was very important, but not just for them, for me, uh, to have a purpose to get out of bed. 
uh, and the horses kept me relatively sane. Um, I had a really good team um, who were fantastic. My head lad, Stefan uh, Namanensky, who's uh, Slovakian, he's been with me 15 years. He lost a family member uh, 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 to cancer and he got quite frightened about it. And Andy Llewellyn was my assistant at the time who worked for Nikki for a while. They, uh, and obviously Tanya, they uh, uh, stood up to the mark. And um, but, uh, but it was important. I say not so much for them, for, for, uh, for me, and to, without sounding really sort of pompous or grand, uh, the horses kept me sane. If you if you were in a sort of twelve stories up in a, some sort of flat and you hadn't got a reason to go to to work or to get up, that would have finished me completely. So you had a reason, and it motivated you to get up to go and see the horses. And I said there were only three days when I. I, I I think I went down, but I came back after half an hour. I just couldn't face it. I just felt awful. Mm-hmm. And it's quite, people I say, how do you feel and everything, but everybody's different. And uh, you just felt exhausted. I didn't feel sick, just knackered. And I didn't want to eat. And so as you don't want to eat and sit, Tanya, it was hard for, for her to see me not wanting to eat and losing weight. And uh, uh, that, was, that was tough, tough for her. Looking back on it now at the time, I didn't appreciate it. And it must've been really, really hard for her. How strong was your mind? Uh, it was pretty strong. There were a couple of days when it wasn't. And I, I said in, in Lee's article, uh, there was one night, day I just couldn't eat and I, I wanted to give up. Not just training, life in general. I literally wanted to go to bed and die. Uh, I just felt awful, which was so selfish of me. Uh, that was thinking of me. Me, me and nothing else but me. And... Um, Tanya and my friends, they had a sort of, sort of joke. When you, and you have to joke a little bit about it. I didn't have cancer, I had ME. It's all about me. Me, me and me. <laughs> and, but you, you, had to sort of, you had to do that, you know. You had to, sort of, you had to have a bit of humour in it. And, and so it did you, need, you needed a bit of tough love as well as, oh, a bit big of, time. A, as, well as the TLC? Yeah, yeah. Oh, big time, definitely. And did you, did you, you, fa- did you find you got that from, from the people that were, no, were nearest no, yeah. to you? Uh, not just, yeah, family, friends... And I, I'm very lucky to train for some, I, I don't call them owners, some friends as well. They kind of, uh, um, I call them friends. And, and they rallied around and were 100% behind me. There were a couple who hurt a bit when I had a couple of horses taken away mid-season. That really did hurt. When I, that's when you need your friends, you know. But I've been down that road a thousand times, certain that every trainer has, so you just have to move on. Um. People took horses away from you because they they weren't running well. They thought you yes, weren't. Yes, I had a sort of uh, I had a uh, come January time we found something amiss with the horses and they were running rubbish. Uh, I didn't have many runners January, February, March. We found out we had to clear all the bedding out and the hay and blah blah blah. I won't bore you with all that sort of details. And luckily they came right in the spring. Probably some one guy, a guy called Mark Burton, who's had horses with me for a while. He, they'd think I think the horses had an empathy with me. They were feeling rubbish when I was feeling rubbish. And they came right when I came right, which is quite sort of um, quite funny, really. But I don't sort of think of things like that. But you look back on it, and it, it was exactly the right time when I started feeling better. The horses started running well. So maybe there was something in it. Though maybe there was. There was an interesting I'm not going to say it wasn't. There, there was an interesting theory at the time. No, you're too diplomatic to say that's a, <laughs> that's a complete load of rubbish. But um, you you did get the all clear. Yeah. Um, but Literally. not until not until two the days spring. after Queen's Gamble won at Cheltenham. Literally two days. I was waiting. Uh, uh, it was the first day I went. I went to Aintree on, on the Friday because we very kindly got invited uh, and had lunch there and only had stayed for three or four races. And then I went to um, Cheltenham for that two-day meeting. Literally the day before the Lambourne Open Day, and uh, obviously she won. And then I got interviewed, and obviously people did know then about me, even though we didn't advertise you one was ill or had been ill. And they asked me about my health. I thought, blimey, God, the last thing I want to do is say something. And I hadn't got my, the, res- the results of my scan, even though I was waiting for them. And I sort of said, well, I'm just waiting for the all clear. And uh, we got it literally two days, the day after the Lambourne Open Day, uh, on that Saturday night. So onwards and upwards, as I say. It must be a, a strange feeling because clearly it's it's something you want to to celebrate, but you're probably so emotionally and physically exhausted. It's it's quite hard to know how to <laughs> how to deal with that as well. I was knackered, uh, having had the Lambourne Open Day on the Friday, and I, even though I sort of took a back step on that and um, uh, didn't, I'm normally in charge of car parking for Lambourne <laughs> Open Day for my sins. 
uh, and uh, then th what happened on Thursday at Cheltenham and um, Saturday we were supposed to be told we'd supposed to be told by my consultant the results and Tanya was going mad was sort of knew we should have I mean well rung the secretary and find out what was scored blah 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 luckily Jeremy Dougal who's our son's godfather who was treated by the same man had his private email address so we pinged him I pinged him an email at nine o'clock on a Saturday night on a bank holiday the, the Easter bank holiday mm -hmm. It bounced straight back, and he was away. I knew he was away on holiday, and it, he rang me that half past nine. And so I'm so sorry, Oliver. I very remiss of me. I, I completely forgot. You're clear of lymphoma. Um, so I, I came out, and um, Tanya was in, in there with the, with my daughter Sabrina and, and her boyfriend. And I just said, "Oh, this, I've just had a phone call. My scans are clean. I'm I'm absolutely knackered. I'm going to bed now." They, they didn't know what to do. They sort of got up and cheered and had another bottle. And they came to bed about two o'clock. I rang Archie up and he was in New Zealand or Australia. I can't remember. It was his birthday the next day. Told him. And I spoke to my immediate family. And then Tanya got onto the WhatsApp group telling him everybody was clear <laughs> and the rest is history. I said it had been the most challenging year of your life. I, I wasn't wrong. And you've talked quite a bit in the interview with Lee today about the fact that you had to move stables. Um, just for, mm. for, for context, it, it, this was a, a yard that you owned, Roanhurst, and then you had to sell in 2002. Yeah. Yep. So you leased it back off the, the owners, and eventually they, they sold it, and your former assistant, Warren Greatrex, moved in um, at the behest of his, his new landlords. It's not a set of circumstances that anybody would would win. No, and it's not something I really want to dive, to look back on. It's done. It's it's done, but it, it, it hurt only because I built it up from I bought it in eighty four, uh, and uh, I built it up from twenty boxes up to what it was then sixty five boxes in that coin pool and everything. So I wanted to finish my career off there. Uh, I, 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 it, it's done. Tim Sider was brilliant. He said, "Look, it's bricks and mortar. Move on. No one's died." So it is what it is. Uh, it's happened. Uh, I've got. A, I, I was when it did happen. There's no way at my very sprightly age, or 66, what it was then. I was going to relocate. Mm -hmm. I've been in Lambourne since 1978 when I took over from Nicky as Fred Winter's assistant, and uh, I was not going to relocate. Uh, uh, and so um, there was no other yard to go to, bar Uplands, which Warren had vacated. Uh, which obviously I started my life in Lambourne with, and uh, it was pretty ranshackled at the time. And then I bumped into Charlie Mann up at the Gallops, and he said, look, I'm going to pack up, come and have a look at this place. And one door closes, another door opens, you know, so it is what it is. And was there a bit of you that actually needed something fresh? If you were going to have to move and you didn't want to move, something new that yeah. you hadn't been to before would actually give you the chance to create a new chapter. Yeah, uh, yes, in some ways, definitely. Um, it's taken me a while just to get, not so much to use the stables, the staff love it, because uh, it's all indoors, it's all barns and everything, which is great. It's not as, I haven't got an equine pool, which I want, even though I got access to, to one. Uh, and there's a few little things, but when you've worked for 36 years in one particular place, you become a, a little bit automatic gear, but you're absolutely right. Sometimes a new challenge comes on, but it's not like I'm going to a new place where you've got new gallops and you've got to get to new, new, you've got to get used to them. So everything was at the fingertips. It's exactly the same. It's literally 800 yards away from Ro Roanhurst. It's just a different approach to, to the gallops. So it was much the same old. Uh, but I always wanted to be associated with Roanhurst. It was, it was my yard. Uh, uh, and uh, if it had been, if I, if it had gone after ten years, different ball game. But thirty six, thirty seven years, it was just hard, you know. But as I said, it's bricks and mortar. It's done. It's finished chapter. I don't want to look back. I'm going to look forward. And you can look forward with a with a very good horse as well. We think, yeah. In in Queen's Gamble, who was so good at, at Cheltenham in April, but was even better the other day. Um, I saw you during the afternoon, and you seemed. You seemed remarkably calm, given the fact that this was a this was a pretty high stakes game. I've been at you it long were playing the other day, Nick. You were um, acting well. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. No, I I was calm. I, I I've always liked her. You never you always dream you're going to have a horse like this again, and uh, especially a homebred, you know. Uh, but it was through um, I hadn't didn't really know Alex Ross to bred her. Uh, and her mother, and raced the mother with Jesse. It was through Josh Yappiaffi, who's the rewards for racing man, who incidentally sponsors for another three years, uh, introduced me to him. And to get a first foal like this was 
it, it's something else, you know, especially a filly. Uh, she is, she is special. She's a good girl. I, I, I was, I've been impressed with her. And there's nothing more, and every trainer would say, the horses who, what we call catch pigeons at home and win every gallop mm. are not necessarily the best horses. She just does what it is on the tin. She does it nicely. And uh, I was very taken back by speaking to Kate Harrington and, and Jessie, who trained the mother, who said she was very identical to her. She was um, quite leggy when she was an eight and nine-year-old, and uh, I mean, Queen's Gamble's mother. So no, it was, it was, it's nice to have a real good horse again. Everybody was delighted for you. Uh, I sense not, not just because you've been unwell, but I think when there is a, uh, an Oliver Sherwood winner, people, people warm to it. Why do you think that is? I don't know. Nick, you'd have to tell me that. I mean, I, it's, I, I honestly don't know. It's just, it's very humbling, very humbling. Do you think it's, it's because people think that, A, you've been, you've been a constant of the game for a, for a long time, but also because people think you play the game the right way? Is there a right way to play the game, do you think? Enjoyment. You've got to enjoy it. I think people now take everything in life, not just racing, everything far too seriously. And from having had cancer, you look at life in a different f frame, definitely. Uh, there's more to life than just training winners. I, I Don't get me wrong, I'm as competitive as W Haggis or N Henderson or P Nichols, I can promise you that. I don't like getting beat. Uh, and I want to dine at the top table, but um, I think uh, I think as well nowadays, I think public sometimes like the underdog. I'm not saying I'm an underdog, but it get, gets a bit... I, I'm going to probably get shot for this, but it, it gets a bit boring sometimes when then Henderson P. Nichols wins every um, every race, or if it's Gordon Elliott or Willie Mullins. And I think nowadays it, the, the, the big people have got even bigger, and it's, it's a bit same old. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when a, 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 a trainer or somebody who's had a, a, a... Well, an underdog who hasn't got a lot of horses and wins a big race, I think the public take to that a bit more sometimes. And, and you, you say uh, that... It's, there's something quite samey about it. There was last weekend, there was this weekend, there will be yeah. next weekend. It is broadly the same face as winning the big races because mm. they've got access to hundreds and hundreds of, of horses in their yard. And, and you said in the piece in the post that you wouldn't want two, two three, three hundred horses no, in your I yard. Could. Is that just because you couldn't get your head round it? Yeah. Or you I, think you can't do the job as well? I don't think I could do the job as well. If I was 30 years younger and starting off, of course I would. But Fred Winter and, and, and Nicky, when he started, he only had 50 horses, and I had 60, 70 horses uh, at my, my heyday when I had the sort of the West Awakes and Rebel Songs and Cruising Altitudes and all those, uh, which was grand. But you've got to have a hell of a good backup team. Uh, I think more so in flat racing, sorry, in jump racing than flat racing. Mm -hmm. Flat racing is a little bit more um, factory farming. I don't mean that to be against flat I love top class flat racing. Uh, it's much more of a numbers game. You've only got a two-year window, really, in a nutshell, flat racing. That's not, that's, I, I quite, I sort of exaggerate a bit there. Jumping, you've got there around a bit more. And I like to get to know the horse. As uh, I think it was, um, I can't remember if it was Gordon Richards Sr., uh, as in, in Nicky's father, said it, it's getting inside the heads of a horse, is, I think, is where the fun, where the real fun is. Uh, 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 getting them fit is relatively relatively straightforward but getting inside the head of a horse I think is the most lovely part of it is somebody if anybody can find a horse you can actually talk back to human beings it's going to make our life much easier but that's half the challenge we see top class racehorses less frequently than perhaps we we used to the real good ones used to run per season yep. more often than than they do now given the fact that technology is better veterinary medicine's better we can keep theoretically we can keep horses sound more effectively why can't we race them more often, do you think? I think the intensity of training is much more so. I mean, uh, Martin Pike changed everything 25 years ago, whatever it was, 30 years ago. Uh, I remember uh, when we started, you sort of trotted around the road three days a week. The horses lasted. They weren't as fit, uh, but the intensity of the training, the intensity of the food they get given now, it, it's all it's all relative. I, I remember getting interviewed once at Fontwall asking me about Martin Pipe, and there was a lot of professional jealousy then when mm. Martin was around. And sort of uh, late eighties, early nineties, yes, everyone was exactly. saying, well, "What's he up what's to? What's he doing? Yeah. What's he giving them? He can't be. They can't be this 
mm-hmm. fit or not fit. They can't be this good. And was it the same with Michael Dickinson before? Yes, that? yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I remember saying one day, I say at Fontwall, and just saying he's making us look like amateurs. And everybody now has raised the bar to join him. They had to, to compete. Um, uh, and uh, it's so much more professional now. I'm not saying they were amateurs in the, in the day, but it was a little bit more amateurish. But um, everybody's joined them in the fitness levels and, uh, as you quite rightly said, uh, computerised uh, uh, stride patterns and uh, blood. Y- you name it, it's there. It's all on computer, right? It's all computerised. I think you should... I, I think it's sad to use uh, computers to train a horse, but you use... You use them to help you train them, but not be dictated to by them. Something you said uh, really, really struck a chord with me there. You said the intensity of training. Yeah. So you know, we might not see horses as often on the race course. Do they you don't. think they're actually getting pushed f- nearer their limit at home before they get to the race course than they were I, I, in the old days? Up to a point. Uh, to, to train a good horse, um, the likes of Constitution Hill, for, for example... Those sort of good horses, uh, there's only a handful of races you can run them in. So you can peak and trough them. You peak them up to a race. Like Nicky would have done that with Constitution Hill yesterday. He'll drop him down a bit and then build him up to the Christmas hurdle, I presume. Or mm-hmm. not the boot, That's it's going to be saying, too yeah. soon. Yeah. And then drop him down again and then build him up to, to um, Cheltenham. Mm-hmm. You've got an every run-of-the-mill horse, you build him up at, and you have to keep him plateaued. And then you enter four or five races. Oh, that's kind of that's too competitive. I don't want to take that on. That one's oh, the ground's gone. And you keep, and right, that's the right race. And then okay, you drop them down for a bit. Then you then you have to hold them. Does that make sense? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You have to hold them for for a couple of weeks to look for the right to the race. And the good horse is uh, the, with, yeah, those sort of good horses. Like Paul Nichols is brilliant at peaking horses. He'll 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 pick a race out six months ago for a horse and then. Then drop it down, then build. But it's a, all, and there's only a, there's only a handful of really good horses. There's more bad or bad's the wrong words. More average horses than there are good horses. Sorry, you can't offend them. They don't. No. They don't understand. They no, don't know no, what you're but saying. But the trainers yeah. and the owners yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I so I did that once with an owner and said their horse is no good. Get rid of it. It's like insulting their child mm-hmm. sometimes. So you've got to know your client you're dealing with. But we digress and everything. So I, I, it, there's no doubt it is. Um, it, it's more intense for horses nowadays. The, yeah, the training methods definitely. And does that mean at the end of their their careers, there's there's less horse there, or can we keep horses reasonably sound? Yes, I I think the willingness to run as they get older sometimes, if they're doing that, not necessarily. So as a result of ROR now retraining the racehorse, they sometimes come to the end of their careers, and you can find other other lives for uh, yeah for them. Uh, I mean, what was that? That was a lovely horse we had at Fred's, Sonny Summers. He won at 17. Mm. That'd be unheard of now. Once you get to... The, and the peaking of the jumping horse uh, 30 years ago was nine. And now it's dropped about seven or eight. And they go a bit. And there was all that hullabaloo about, in France, the French don't last after their six, but they're trained so hard from two, three, four. And there's no, there's no programme for them after six, virtually. But then, of course, you know, that, that used to be the theory, didn't it? If you've got a good French horse, you could get a couple of good seasons out of the horse, and then that horse was not going to be as good as, as it was anymore. And then people like Paul Nichols started to turn that on its totally. head with Corso Star winning races at 11 Absolutely. and Neptune Collange winning the Grand but, National when he was but old. But he, he, he didn't have to... I mean, he didn't race them as much. He was more sparing as Definitely. he went on. And the yeah. same with Henrietta with Best Mate. People criticised her. But he wouldn't have lost if he'd been trained... Uh, to race more races and everything. He wouldn't have won three Gold Cups, not in a million months or some days. So if you, now with, with your good horses and your, your stable star, if, if she goes on and, and does well, do you expect it to be sparingly campaigned? Yes. Do you expect her to be sparingly mm. campaigned uh, accordingly? Definitely. I, I, and I am a little, I accept I'm a little bit, I am a bit old-fashioned, but I was the way I was brought up. You have to adapt and change. I get that 100%. But as I said, Queen's Gambit's only four. Uh, I know... I'm very pleased, by the way, that I saw Nicky's horse um, run in the mayor's hurdle race yesterday and he wasn't kept the bumpers. And she's the cheer, before, because yeah. she's now out the way, out of the bumpers this mm. season. I'd like to think that Queen's Gamble will be doing what she's doing next year. Mm-hmm. But what's the point of losing your novice hurdle certificate now when you're halfway through, or nearly halfway through the season? Uh, so uh, she, we look forward to that next year. What now, after everything that, that you've been through and the career that you've had, what now drives you? Winners. 
I'd love to. I'd love to have a Cheltenham winner again. I've been lucky enough to have had six festival winners a long time ago. Um, which, but, which was Coulton the last one? You tell me. <laughs> Is it Coulton? Been. Probably was. And we went to war that year with five really fancied horses, and they all got beat. Large Action in the Champion Hurdle, Biwu got beat in the Sun Alliance, Auburn Castle got beat in the Grand Annual, Caliso Bay in the Supreme, and Coulton was the last last one. He got and he won a short head, I think, owned by Martin St. Quinton. In the Cathcart, now, the old Cathcart. The old Cathcart, now as chairman of Chel- of, of, of Chel- Potentially, actually, Coulton was the best horse I've ever trained, but he just wasn't a natural jumper. But uh, no, I'd love to have a, another Cheltenham win. I, obviously, to win a Grand National was just unbelievable. But Cheltenham is um, is uh, it would be fantastic, yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny how you remembered every single one of those and the <laughs> and uh, the ones that were beaten. And the, it just goes to show you, you must empathise so much with those trainers who go into the festival oh. with six odds on, well, six odds on favourites, but six favourites and. But do you know, I, I I I do I do appreciate it now. But at the time, I didn't. Mm-hmm. But you guys now, uh, the, the the TVs and the press make it even more um, pressurised, which I think is grand. And it, you had to, had to cope with it because at the time, it wasn't sort of it wasn't so sort of media concentrated, Cheltenham, as it is now. No. There's no doubt about it. No one is. You've raised the bar completely. Everybody has on that score, and it's. It is a little bit sad, and it's an old cliche. Is you start winning a race in July or whatever it is, uh, Cheltenham band. Uh, everything's around Cheltenham, which I think is a bit sad. There's more to life than just Cheltenham. Some people say there isn't more to life than Cheltenham. But you've said the but thing I've that drives you is having, exactly. a, having, having another Cheltenham, Cheltenham festival. Winner. I'd love to. So I contradict myself uh, a little bit. But no, winners, winners drive. But, it, and, but, and is, it, but that is, that, is that more about being identified with dining at the top table, Te- do you definitely. think, rather than the actual... As you no. say, but actual bricks and mortar of Cheltenham, you know, it's yeah, more no. about. You want those good horses, being... those big horses. Every trainer, again, you you get up. It's the reason for getting up in the morning. It's, you hope you're going to see. Hello, this is a bit special, and you just you dream. I, the more you do it, that you don't get overexcited, but you just think this might be, yeah, something a bit special. Uh, everybody does that. There's no doubt about it. Do you think that whatever you do from now on in anything will ever be able to eclipse many clouds? Probably not. Um, a Cheltenham Festival winner won't be far off. <laughs> but it's extraordinary, actually. I, I, I dine out on this as well. After after winning the um, the National, I had to do sort of TV, uh, on the phone, interviews from around the world. I couldn't believe it, from Hong Kong and Australia and America and everything. And they said, do you always want to win the National? I said, well, actually, I didn't. I never even thought about it. I wanted to win at the Cheltenham Festival. What's that? Mm. They'd never heard of the Gold Cup or the Cheltenham Champion Hurdle or anything, but everybody's heard of the Grand National in the world. So um, winning the Grand National, it's, 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 it's on your CV for life. So it's, it's, no, it was very difficult watching it again now. You, you, know, you don't mind watching this again, no, do you? No, I still haven't got, the, I haven't got, the, I haven't got it on TV at home. We, we sort of, you, you said you'd get me one. You, yeah, a copy of the National. We haven't got it yet. Well, you still, you've still, you've <laughs> so still not got a copy. I have to go on my phone to watch it and Google Many Clouds is National, please, to watch Right, it. I think we can, probably, we can <laughs> probably do something about that, I think. You might, might even be able to leave this, leave this building with Look one. Lovely old Trevor. What a, what a loss he is to National Hunt Racing. But, you know, luckily, luckily the family are carrying on, so happy days. Um... How important was was Trevor Hemmings to you? Not just because of many clouds, but his his advice, his wisdom, his his hey, steadfast well, nature, if you w- like. Without Trevor, I wouldn't have run him in the national. End of story that day because I thought it was a year too too soon. But the introduction to Trevor was done obviously through David Minton, who um, I've known for forever. Um, and through Trevor, and I, I've said it again in the post today, um, with the introduction of Tim Sider coming and joining us, and um, and Trevor, I, I don't think I'd be training now. There's no doubt about it. I got an influx and I went through a, a lull and they had the likes of obviously not many clouds and Tim had Puffin Billy and Deputy Dan and we had three real good horses and it roller balled on. So um, I'm, I'm just... I, T, T always takes the mickey out of me. I, I'm, I'm absolutely no good at selling myself. You know, the horses do the, do, do the talking and I'm not one to sort of get up and sing and dance. But you're... You're very sociable, and you're yeah. not as much now. I'm, I don't get the trip as well as I used to. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're you're not a difficult person to get on with. No, no, you're no I'm very, very easy to get on with. There's plenty of people who'd like to have a horse with you. Do you think now, as a trainer, then to acquire these horses, you just need to have a bit more of a cutting edge, a bit more of a killer instinct? If you Probably. see an owner really go for him. Yeah, but her. that's not me. It's not me. And and again, I I, I 
the money they spend now on these horses, uh, these boutique horses that the sales have, I think it's just astronomical. I mean, it's just delally. Uh, and I, when you see it from a, balancing the books, which you shouldn't do, you're, doing, you're going into buying a horse with your eyes open as entertainment. Uh, and, and I get that, but it's just madness, some of the money they spend now to buying these point-to-pointers. Uh, it's just not not for me. If you if you came to me, you won the lost and you want you just go and buy the bet. But I said, well, can we buy five at a hundred or eighty than buying one at five hundred? Uh, the, the the law of averages is you throw enough darts at the dartboards, you'll hit the bullseye occasionally. It's a slightly different phenomenon happening now, isn't it? Where you're going to get four or five or six pretty wealthy people, and they're each going to put sixty, seventy, eighty grand into the pot. Totally. And they can have their half a million pound horse, who's an almost guaranteed success because he's come out of the Irish Jumps point yeah. field. And uh, but again, going back to what we were saying earlier about the, the smaller train, the smaller train is the wrong word, but uh, the likes of my, the numbers, uh, you're sort of having, hoping to get one good horse, which lucky enough Queen's Gamble is, and lucky enough Alex has turned down a few quid for her. Um, but other trainers get a horse like that and relying on some of the big boys to come in and buy, buy it just for them to survive. You're, you're 67, which is something that always surprises me because you always seem ageless <laughs> to me. Um, <laughs> Don't feel it sometimes. I, I know, I understand that, but you're, <laughs> you're 67 at the age at which an awful lot of people would be saying, OK, I'm, I'm done now with whatever career they happen to be, whether they're working in this, that or the other. Yeah, but, what you, but what am I going to do? Well, this is what I was going to ask you. you you've got through a very serious illness. Um, you had a lot of success in your career. Why do you still want to get up and train racehorses every day? Because I enjoy it. There's times when I don't enjoy it, when things go wrong. Uh, Have you ever thought, um, this is it, I'm oh, packing oh, it big in? Time. Oh, big time. Oh, absolutely. Out, retire. Definitely. Definitely. And T did it oh, years ago. We had, she, I wanted to stop, and uh, we'd had a real rough time. And then she said, you're not going to do it when... On that, and we had a double at Newbury. Lies Green won, and Argenta Luna won the mayor's final. Uh, finally, she said, "Right now, you stop." After having, of course, you couldn't because you're on a high. Yeah, and um, quite, quite clever that. She's a clever girl. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, so that was the right time, but there was no way it could. But somebody again said to me, um, it was a guy called Barry Gallup, who I rode a horse for, for Peter Bailey years ago, and he said, owning, training or riding racehorses is 95% disappointment and 5% enjoyment, but the 5% enjoyment make up for the 95% disappointment, and that is so true with racing. The highs are very high, the lows are bad for training, because you're dealing with all the problems you have in horses day in, day out. And there's nothing worse now. And I've been doing it for 38 years, having to ring up an owner to say, uh, your horse has got a tendon, he's out for a year, or he's done an injury, he's cracked this or done that and everything. It's, I just hate it. But it's, it's life. It's part and parcel of the game. And it will forever. It will forever, absolutely. Be your life. Yeah. Oh, it's my life. I, couldn't, I, 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 I can't change now. I enjoy it. Uh, I, I've got a great team at home. I've got a fantastic family. And I've got lots of really good friends which I'm afraid your brother's one of them. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> and he'd give me some bollocking if I didn't mention his name over this. He would, to be fair. <laughs> he would, to be fair. Well, he's very lucky to have you as well. Don't, don't worry about that. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a break. Oliver, for the moment, thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Oliver Sherwood. And Oliver's going to stay with us. And after this, he'll be joined by Neil Channing for this week's Talking Points.